It is my great honor to introduce Dr. Pamela Ronald, Professor of Plant Pathology at UC Davis and Director of the Institute for Food and Agricultural Literacy. She's been a hero of mine ever since I read her book, Tomorrow's Table. So pleased you could join us today. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, Milo and Rosalie, for putting this uh, fantastic program together. Well, I first became interested in plants because uh, my mother was an obsessive gardener and, uh, and, and also an excellent cook. And uh, I grew up in San Mateo, so I'm a local. And when I was, before I was born, my parents built a 500 square foot cabin in the mountains. So we used to spend summers up there and my brothers and I would just go hiking for days with our little um, uh, tarp and sleeping bag and, and just wander around and look at plants. And I really, really love that. It's a really important part of my life. So I've always been very, very interested in, in plants. And can you tell us a little bit what your high school science classes were like? Okay, well, I have to say they're not as good as your classes. Um, <laughs> we had, um, I, I remember taking biology in summer school and I, I already loved biology, but I did not love the class. It was very strange. It was sort of a memorization. I didn't learn that uh, biologists actually discovered things. Somehow when I was in high school, I thought biology was just learning a bunch of stuff and repeating experiments that other people had already done. So it really wasn't until college that I, I think I understood the, the excitement of, of discovery, which is a, a critical part of biological research. Hmm. Hmm. Now, um, could you talk a little bit about the difference between the sorts of bioengineered crops that you develop and some of the ones that are more famous to people in the media? Um, yeah, thanks Milo and thanks for using the term bioengineered. I really like that term because it's a little bit more neutral. I think that, that you hear in the media and it encompasses lots of different approaches that we, we um, use in plant breeding and in my lab. So, so in my lab, we do a lot of um, introduction of genes from a rice plant into a rice plant to try to understand function because I'm essentially a basic biologist. So we're trying to understand the fundamentals of um, particular mechanisms. So for example, we're very interested in understanding how plants resist disease or tolerate environmental stress. And so my lab has isolated genes that are very important for these um, types of biological mechanisms. And the, we do, one of my collaborators was able to put one of the genes we identified out into the field. And I should say it's, it's a very important crop because it allows farmers to grow rice even during times of flood, which is uh, especially problematic during climate change. Um, the way my collaborators developed this rice was through a um, approach called marker-assisted breeding. And so it's not regulated. It, because it's a rice gene in a rice plant, it's not regulated. So there is not um, a lot of fear and public attention to those crops. So I would say um, a lot of the attention goes to crops like um, eggplant in Bangladesh. So they've introduced, scientists there have introduced the gene from a bacteria. And that sometimes makes people a little nervous. Like, why do you want a bacterial gene in a plant? Uh, well, the, the reason is it allows the, the plant to resist a very serious insect. And so the farmer doesn't need to spray chemical insecticides anymore. And that is, it's now called BT eggplant. So that's, uh, been a really important crop. We have a question from Aliyah who asks, do you work with specific types of rice, like brown rice or white, long grain, organic? So there are, in a sense, two major types of rice um, that you're probably familiar with in, in the store, short grain and long grain. In California, we grow the short grain rice and also, it's very popular in Japan. We mostly work with short grain rice because it's easier to work with genetically. 
um, all rice is brown at some point uh, in Asia and the United States. You get white rice by milling off the, the outside germ of, of the rice. And um, so that's something, you know, probably quite interesting to people that uh, any brown rice you can make white. We have a question from Stefan who asks, how has your work helped recent yields? So I was lucky to be part of this global project, um, the one I briefly mentioned, which is submergence tolerance in rice. So um, around the world, about 4 million tons of rice, enough to feed 30,000 people, is lost every year till flooding. And even though rice grows well in standing water, if the rice plant is completely covered by water, most rice varieties will just die after, you know, two or three days. Uh, so what's been really exciting is this rice that was developed at the International Rice Research Institute has been planted in, in many, many farms in India and Bangladesh. Last year, six million farmers grew that rice, which is called sub one rice. And they see about a 60% yield advantage. And, and in some very, very poor parts of the world in Eastern India, farmers are able to grow rice where, where they weren't able to grow before be, because of flooding. So the yield advantage has been enormous, 60% um, or of course in some places 100% if you're growing rice where you couldn't grow rice before. And that was just because of a single gene has that incredible power to make the plant survive a flood. So this is something I think scientists, geneticists, plant breeders um, are very, very excited about um, this possibility of developing more plants that, are, that can tolerate uh, changes in climate, heat, drought, floods. Hmm. Jake asks, what promising advancements are in progress in your field? Okay, well, that's a very good question. Um, we still have huge challenges. Um, it's not always so easy to take a single gene and have this dramatic increase in yield. So scientists um, are looking for these types of genes. In our case, the gene was found in an ancient rice variety that's not grown anymore. And it's been very, very slow, but now, uh, scientists, for example, in rice have sequenced 3,000 rice genomes and including wild species. So there's a lot of excitement about learning the function of many genes that haven't been studied before that might be useful to bring into our agricultural crops um, to increase the genetic diversity of those crops and bring in traits that um, will be useful to farmers and consumers. And there's many different approaches around the world to do this um, that require big data sets um, and, and a lot of mathematics, bioinformatics. So I think that's a really, really exciting area is to um, be able to understand and handle very large data sets. And with a genetic background, you can be uh, very, I, I think there'll be many jobs in that area for many years to come. Stefan asks, how stress intolerant is rice? Ha and have you worked on making rice more resistant? So we worked on um, two aspects of that. So there's many rice varieties grown all over the world. And generally, they're locally adapted to a particular environment. So what a, what a rice farmer grows um, in the Central Valley here is, is, is going to be different than a rice farmer in India or Bangladesh is growing. Um, but we've been very interested in two traits, the submergence tolerance that I mentioned. And um, we have been able with collaborators to develop a rice that can tolerate flooding. And we've also worked on disease resistance. And that was, you saw the leaves in the, in the video. Um, so we've been able to show that a single gene can make the plant uh, completely immune to infection by a specific bacterial disease. Aliyah asks, what is your favorite kind of rice? What do you make at home? We make um, short grain white rice many, many times a week. Uh, we used to grow, we used to eat brown rice, but uh, we got, I guess we got hungrier and we were more impatient and uh, white rice grows faster. 
and we went to Japan when my daughter was eight years old and she fell in love with white rice and 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 then refused to eat brown rice so we just have gotten the habit of always making short grain white rice so we we have the local um variety from california hmm. Riken asks do you or other people you work with often have to deal with others who don't really have a good understanding of genetic engineering slash have negative opinions towards it yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, well, my husband and I wrote a book, which Milo mentioned, and when we started writing the book, we thought, well, we'll just talk about genetics and explain breeding. But then we realized that there was so, so little known just about agriculture in general, because most of us are no longer on the farm, um, that we really spent a lot of time trying to explain why farmers like to plant um, uh, seeds that are resistant to um, disease or tolerant of stress. Um, so we did give it a shot in that in that book to try to explain uh, food and farming. Um, and so we, we the conversations are endless. So yes, we do have many, many conversations about that. And I think, um, as you're probably well aware, uh, there's a just a lot of disinformation that we all get um, on all aspects of our lives. And it, it's been really challenging for scientists to get um, their message out about the, the basics of science and what scientific evidence shows and, um, and, and trying to engage uh, the public and issues on environmental sustainability and food and ag. Uh, so this will be um, an ongoing challenge. Of course, we need the help of all young people to, uh, to learn about food and ag and to communicate with policymakers and um, vote for politicians that um, provide accurate information. Mm -hmm. So if a student were interested in data science and, um, and genetics, in addition to biology, what sorts of skills should they be trying to acquire in high school? Should they learn a computer language like Python? Well, that's a, a good question. Yeah, I think that would help. I think in high school, if you have um, ability uh, classes where you can learn computer languages or even higher level well just math in general i mean you really should take classes that you enjoy in high school um but i think if you can um have a computer science program or class or or mathematics or statistics um all that will will, will set you on the path but you also can get all that in college as well uh, so you don't necessarily need to get all that in high school but uh if you have a chance to take those classes you can find out if you like it um, and learn, learn more about those areas. Hmm. Now, Rosalie asks, what are the most rewarding parts of your work? I would say, you know, the, the working with people in my lab. So you saw that video, you probably got a sense how wonderful um, many people, in, everybody in my lab is. So that was Hannah, who, who uh, really coordinates a lot of our programs. And Flora is a, a postdoctoral fellow, so she has a PhD. And she's doing many interesting experiments. Um, and so for me, it's, it's so exciting to hear their results and um, to hear them thinking about other approaches and, and just the discoveries they make. I, I think scientists, probably almost everybody would say it's, it's that, that, that rush of making a discovery that, that really keeps you glued to, to science. Hmm. Hmm. Well, um, I think we are just about out of time. Oh, we have one more question from Sophia. How many scientists usually work on each project? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, all labs, all projects are different in my lab. Um, usually there's sort of a leader on a project and Floor is one of those leaders. And then when someone new comes to the lab, I like people to try to work together because it's like going into a kitchen, right? You need somebody to show you where the things are, how the machines work, and, and it takes time to develop your own ideas and areas of where you're going to go. So uh, we generally have two or three big projects that uh, there'll be three or four people working on together, each with sort of their own specialty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I believe that wraps up our question and answer session. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Hannah Bartram and I work at UC Davis in the lab of Professor Pam Ronald. Today I'll be telling you about the work we do in plant genetics in the lab. First of all, you might be wondering why we care so much about plants. The world's population is growing quickly and we need to feed everyone without further destroying the environment. Biotechnology is one tool that scientists use to reach this goal, allowing scientists to develop crops with resistance to diseases and crops with higher vitamin content. By improving the crops with genetic techniques, we can successfully grow more food on the same amount of land. In this lab, we specifically focus on rice, which is a staple food that billions of people depend on. Today, we'll be showing you how we genetically transform rice using a technique called tissue culture, where we use bacteria to insert genes into the plant genome so we can study them. This is a powerful tool that allows us to run experiments looking at specific molecules in the rice to figure out what those molecules do for the plant. Let's go visit Dr. Flora Erkley in the lab to see how we actually do genetic transformation. Hello, I'm Flor. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Bams Ronan Lab, and today I will be showing you one of the most common methods used for rice transformation. The most common methods used for rice transformation utilizes a bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. We use this bacterium to transform plants because Agrobacterium has the natural ability to transfer its own DNA into plants. In this case, we will make in transgenic rice plants by integrating a piece of DNA called tDNA transferred from the bacteria into the plant's genome. First, we need to introduce our gene of interest, shown here in pink, into a DNA element called a plasmid that we engineered into the bacteria. Then we'll put the bacteria in contact with a mass of rice cells and the agrobacterium will take care of transferring the gene we are interested in into the plant through its own natural process. Then from that mass of cells, we grow plants that hopefully have specific traits that we are looking for because of the genes we inserted. The plants we are showing today are genetically engineered to have higher levels of a molecule that we hypothesize has a role in making the rice plant immune to disease. Modifying the amount of this molecule the plant makes is one way we can test this hypothesis. By doing this genetic transformation, we modify the rice to cause an observable change, a phenotypic change, in the plant that can be linked to the molecule's function in disease resistance. In our transformation protocol, we start with mature rice seeds. First, we grind them up in order to remove the outer husk of the rice grain and reveal the seeds inside. We place the seeds in tubes and sterilize them in order to eliminate any microorganism growing on top of the seeds. Then, we grow them in a special gel called a culture or growth medium, which contains certain chemicals that will start the process of growing a mass of cells called a callus. We will work with this calli for our transformation. The calli grow in the incubator for nine days. Next, we infect the calli with agrobacterium and let them shake for half an hour. Then, we scar the extra bacteria and dry the calli. We'll transfer them to a petri dish and let them grow for a few days in the darkness at room temperature. This gives the agrobacterium time to transfer its DNA into the plant. We will continue the transformation process, allowing the calli to grow on a new medium in the incubator. While the calli are growing, we start a selection process. During the selection process, only the calli that actually receive DNA from the agrobacterium are allowed to grow. Some of the cells didn't get transformed by the agrobacterium, so we will throw those away. This is what is called a positive selection. We only keep the calli we are interested in. But how do we know which plants to keep during the positive selection? The genetic differences are not visible to the naked eye. We actually took care of that when we infected the cells with the agrobacterium. The piece of DNA that the agrobacterium transferred to the rice cells didn't just have the gene we are interested in, it also had a selection marker gene. The medium the calli are growing in 
has a special chemical in it, which means that only the gallae that receive the selection marker, and therefore the gene of interest, are able to grow in the media containing the chemical. After 10 days on the selection medium, not all of our gallae have survived. Notice that some of the gallae turn brownish, while the others remain creamish. The creamish color gallae are the ones that remain active, alive, and they will be subsequently transferred to fresh selection media. We'll do this at least two more times, allowing the positive gallae to keep growing. After we finish the selection process, we continue with the regeneration, which is when the cados becomes a rice plant. This is possible because this media contains a combination of plant hormones that will induce this process. The regenerating shoots are finally moved to a media that allows root to develop and then the plant is ready to be moved to the greenhouse to complete its life cycle and produce seeds. The seeds harvested from our new plants will be grown and analyzed to see if we can observe differences compared to a non-transgenic plant. In this case, we transform the plant with a gene that we suspect makes it resistant to disease. Next, we will infect these engineer plants with the bacteria that cause the disease and determine whether they get sick. We hope our hypothesis gets confirmed and the gene we added helps keep the plant healthy. Ultimately, developing healthier plants means farmers can grow more food for the world. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed. Just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Ronald, for taking the time to talk with us today and, and for that incredible video. I know how much work went into that. And, uh, well, Hannah gets all the credit for that. You know, I, I really like it too, and it's fun. You, you can see the lab, you get a sense of what it's like. So uh, you're all welcome to come by. And, you know, if you're at UC Davis, if you decide to go to UC Davis for college, come by, you can come work in the lab. In any college you go to, there's often faculty looking for students that want to volunteer in their lab, and it's a great way to learn uh, about science.